good morning. Now you know who I am, and I would like to find something out about you as well. Can I just check who among you works for a university? Well, that's the vast majority, I think. Thank you. Um, who among you works for a government institution? Okay. And is there anybody who works for the Dutch government? Oh. Uh, I apologize in advance. Um, let me explain. Uh, two days ago, I had a meeting with my supervisory board, the supervisory board of my university. And I'm the vice president of Team Delft, and that means that I'm um, responsible for education at my university, among others. Now, on the agenda were many things, uh, including the performance agreement that we have with the Dutch government. Um, do you have performance agreements as well? Yeah, no, not everybody. Okay, well, we have a performance agreement. So uh, they, are, they are on issues such as the percentage of students that switch uh, to another program after their first year, or they are about the percentage of our teaching staff uh, that, gets, uh, that has a teaching qualification, or about the number of students that get their bachelor's diploma, diploma on time. And I think these are important issues, but again, during this meeting I was thinking, is this really what my government expects from me and my university? I think my government should expect much more and be more ambitious, and so should we. Now, what I will do in the next 15 minutes is discuss two things with you, two things I've been thinking about quite a lot in the last few months, um, two ambitions or two ideas. But before that, before I do that, I would like to show you a short movie of my university and the online ambitions that my university, TU Delft, has. Now, I hope that convinced you uh, about um, uh, our ambitions at TU Delft, but the point is, uh, is it enough? Are we, as universities, or even my university, are we ready for the 21st century? Um, our ambitions are not only about online education, but because I, I really believe that online is just a means, it's not a goal in itself. But what we have, we do have a series of goals that we want to establish with online education. So we don't just do it for the sake of it. One of the goals is that we want to improve our own campus education as well. The second goal is that we want to reach out to as many uh, people who are interested in our type of education worldwide. Now, um, we have a strategy for that, and actually we have made some improvements financially as well. Most of our online materials are for free, but we also provide some uh, uh, online education to professionals. And so by doing that, we been able to make, generate some money to break even or to make some money for, to fi finance our online education program. Now you saw in the, in the video that we have now 670,000 learners online. We've done that in, I think, in a period of over, just over two years, and I'm quite sure that at the end of this year we will have reached 700,000 learners. But the question is, is it enough? For example, 
what if? What if students start cherry-picking their courses from all over the world and they don't need RTU Delft courses anymore? Or what if companies start to recognize totally different types of programs as well? That they don't go for accredited diplomas that my university provides, but, you know, they don't care where a university or where a student gets his or her diploma from. Or what if Facebook or LinkedIn become the gatekeepers for learning. Now, I would like to explore this a little bit more with you. LinkedIn, companies such as LinkedIn, Facebook, Uber, or Airbnb. Now, LinkedIn and Uber have become very, very successful companies. Just young. I think they've only been around for a few years, but already they are extremely, extremely successful. But there are also some funny things about uh, LinkedIn, I'm sorry, about Uber and Airbnb. The first funny thing is that they don't have taxis and they don't have hotels. That's weird, isn't it? But they do own the data. The second thing is that they don't have hotel workers and they don't have taxi drivers either. People who work via uh, these two companies, they're paid per job. And the third funny thing is, I'm, I'm also not sure if they are true successes of the free market, because they seem to be almost monopolies. Anyway, most people think that uh, this is what, what's happening in the hotel world and in the taxi world, and this has nothing to do with higher education. But I'm not so sure. Perhaps we will ha uh, have a broker, such as Airbnb, or um, uh, companies like that in higher education as well. And perhaps people here in the audience, and me, myself, we will be the taxi drivers of higher education. Now let's have a look at LinkedIn. I'm sure that everybody here in this room is on LinkedIn, right? Now what we have done is that we have given a lot, tons and tons of information to LinkedIn. And we've done that on a voluntary basis. Information about our personal data, our, our educational background, our profession, endorsements. I, I have a lot of endorsements on online education, so you're in safe hands with me. Um, but I'm always looking for more, so. Um, LinkedIn recently, or I think well, already quite a, a while ago, they bought an online education company called Linda. And they also bought a company called Bright. Linda is an online education company, and Bright is a, is a, a company that makes algorithms to combine people looking for jobs with vacancies. And soon, LinkedIn will find something similar to link potential students with universities. Now, what if, um, if LinkedIn doesn't ma match potential students with my university, or with your university, but perhaps with the cheapest university, or the most American university, or the least American university? Some people say that we shouldn't worry because we have the students, we have the data, and we have the content. But honestly, look at your own university and think about how fast or how good we are with big data. I think we are very slow and very bureaucratic with big data. Would you agree? Yeah. Especially if you compare us to companies such as Amazon or TripAdvisor. I think, to be honest, even dating services, online dating services, have a better chance to become the Uber of higher education. Still, I think that's wrong. Dating services, Amazon, LinkedIn, I think our ambition should be that we ourselves, higher education institutions, also in the future that we will be the Uber in higher education. Now, if we want to do that, I think we have to do some things to get our act together. One thing is, understandably, that we have to really be able to work with big data. We have to become much more clever in doing that. But there are also more things we have to do. We should understand our students better. I think we should deli deliver better services. Um, perhaps students don't have their own personal learning style, but I think we should uh, take their backgrounds or what they already know into account much better than we are doing at present. I think we should also increase access to students currently, who we are currently not uh, reaching out to. I think we should change our administration, our payment system, for example, students should be able to pay via PayPal, for example, or we should also offer 24-7 services. 
And I think we should focus much better on the things that we are good at, our strengths. So that means we have to change our mindsets. Oh, that's a sheet about the Uber effect. Let's change our, change our mindsets. Now I would like to uh, move to my second point. What are the strong points of a university? Now for starters, one thing that's very clear is that we are the units that combine research and education. And the other thing is that we have a millennium worth of experience in teaching higher education. But I think we have some other assets as well. One of the things is that our campuses are fantastic meeting grounds for people who are looking for knowledge or who want to share ideas. I don't know what the situation is on your campus, but at TU Delft, since the introduction of, uh, of, of laptops and, and all kinds of computers and iPhones, uh, my campus has never been as busy. My students are there from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock uh, in the evening. And just before exams, in the two weeks before exams, students are there from 8 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock midnight in the library. My campus has never been that busy. Also, companies come to TU Delft and they say, why is it so difficult to meet your professors? I would like to meet your professors and see what the latest knowledge this or that field is. And also, um, and little, uh, new startup companies also come to me and say, you know, I would really like to have a, lo <coughs> a location on uh, the campus of TU Delft. So it's much easier to, uh, see, to meet students uh, for my vacancies or, or uh, professors with uh, particular knowledge. So I think that is also one of the assets that we have as a campus, as a university. We may not have the monopoly of knowledge and information anymore, but we have a fantastic meeting ground. That does imply that we have to become more permeable, so more open to other people that are regular students and our regular staff. We have to have an open campus. So an open campus is open for our normal students, lifelong learners, business, startups, etc. I also believe that we have to become a global campus. And I would like to explain a little bit more about what I mean with the global campus. I think the funny thing about MOOCs is, and I would like to talk a little bit about MOOCs, the funny thing about MOOCs is that um, that has been tremendously successful. I think we have about 2,000 or 3,000 MOOCs online worldwide with millions and millions of users. I mean, even my university alone already has 700, almost 700,000 learners. But there are some audiences that we have not reached. Actually, there are quite a lot of audiences that we have not reached. Um, you already mentioned some of that. That should be one of the goals we have with MOOCs. And there's one particular group we haven't reached at all, and that's our own students. Isn't that odd? students of my university, they may have looked at a MOOC, but most of them won't have. So regular campus university students do not use MOOCs. And why is that the case? It's because they don't get credits for it. So I think what we should do now is set a next step in the MOOC movement and in online learning, and that is to provide credit for MOOCs. So that is not such an easy thing because uh, programs are highly regulated. So I think we should start with easy things such as MOOCs for electives or MOOCs for minors or MOOCs for PhD courses. But I'm, I'm absolutely sure that we should uh, take the next steps because wouldn't it be great if a TU Delft student could take a MOOC on French theatre from Sorbonne or a Boston University um, a student being able to take a MOOC from TU Delft about, for example, leadership in technology. If we would do that, if we would open up these huge numbers of MOOCs for credit for our regular students, that would mean opening up a vast body of knowledge for them, and I'm sure that would be really interesting for them. Now, if we want to do that, because it sounds easier uh, than it is, if we do that, we have to need to uh, solve some issues, and the first issue that we have to solve is the money issue. Um, Higher education lives in, in totally different systems worldwide. If you look at tuition fees, for example, you know that there are huge differences. In, uh, for, for example, students at American universities have to pay uh, high tuition fees, ranging from, I suppose, $20,000 to $60,000 per year, whereas students in Europe 
uh, pay a lot less. Sometimes uh, higher education is for free, and in my country, uh, students pay around 1,900 euros per year. Those are huge differences that also define the flexibility that universities have or offer to uh, when they want to play a role in this MOOC for credit movement. And I think probably the solution, I haven't found the real solution yet, but I think probably the solution is to do offer MOOC for credits, but not to have, to, to have a MOOC credit system, transfer system, but not to have a financial transfer system. So not change money between institutions. But this is one thing that we have to solve. The other thing we have to solve is a coding system. Not all MOOCs are the same, and it's very important to know what a MOOC is uh, if you want to fit it into a regular bachelor or master program. For example, is it a first year subject, a third year subject, is it difficult or is it beginner's level, is it four weeks or is it ten weeks? So we have to find a coding system to be able to um, put MOOCs as building blocks in our regular programs. Now, there are some examples already. Within Europe, we have the European Credit Transfer System, the ECTS, and our Australian colleagues have something similar. So perhaps we can use that. But there are also other examples from outside higher education. I would like to show uh, um, one of them. That's the airline industry. The airline industry has become highly competitive, and what a lot of airliners have done is uh, they've set up alliances, a group of uh, airline companies that cooperate and um, so for example if you book a ticket with Lufthansa you can fly to uh, many other places as well because Lufthansa is in the Star Alliance and aligned with other air companies, airliners. Now to be able to do that you need a coding system and the coding system you will op uh, often find on your boarding pass. It tells you where you bought your tickets, where you're flying to, business class, economy, etc. So perhaps we can use something like that as inspiration for a higher education MOOC coding system as well. So we need something. We have to solve the money thing, we have to solve the coding thing. But the most important thing is quality and trust. Now I mentioned this uh, Star Alliance in which Lufthansa is active, and uh, here you find the, um, the Star Alliance. Now with Lufthansa, as part of the Star Alliance, you, it's not only that you can fly almost anywhere, you can all also do that with high quality, and it's always a very sort of trustworthy, um, you know that you can fly safely, and quality is guaranteed. Now, I think this is something that we should do for universities as well, because I think it's naive to expect that my teachers or my examination boards will accept just any move from all over the world. What they need is to be, they have to be able to trust it. So it has to be from an institution that they know and value and trust. So I think this is what we should do in, in analogy with uh, Star Alliance. We should set up an alliance of peer universities. And the analogy, by the way, is not from me, but it's from my colleague Carl from EPFL in Lausanne. And this is what it looks like. This is what it could look like. So. My ambition one, if you remember, was about uh, becoming our own broker in higher education. And my ambition two is to become an open and global campus. Now, there's one last thing I would like to say, and that is uh, the following. A lot of my story has been about um, universities as institutions and our future question if we still have a future. But quite frankly, I think that is not the issue. The issue is something is not if TU Delft will be around for another 100 years or not. What is actually important is that is what we do. It's our added value, the added value that we have, not the institution, but what we do. And I believe there are plenty and plenty of things, plenty of goals that we can still work on. These are the United Nations uh, Sustainability Goals. Solve poverty, make sure that we have clean water and sanitation, um, zero hunger and quality education. So this is what I suggest. I suggest that we just focus on our jobs, do what we do best, and educate the world. Thank you. <laughs>